just worship you, Father, through your word. We thank you, Father, for speaking to us through your word. And, Father, we just give you praise the Lord. We thank you, Father, for the study downstairs. And, Father, that you minister, Father, through it. And, Father, we just uh, thank you for what you're doing and you're doing in each life. And, Father, we just thank you, Lord, and give you praise and glory now in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're in Nehemiah chapter 3, and without going back each time and kind of uh, going over what we've already studied. We've studied about the walls, rebuilding the walls, and last week the major thing that we kind of focused on was you got to have a good foundation and you got to get the rubble out. You can't build a wall on a foundation that's got rubble under it. Uh, you, and all of this, even though we're in Nehemiah, we originally started in Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the uh, uh, warfare and we're going to see where this ties in here in a couple of lessons from now. <clears throat> we just took a side journey back here. What Nehemiah basically shows us is our spiritual walk and, and the problems that we're going to face in that spiritual walk. We can see a whole lot through uh, what we study here in Elijah and how it uh, relates to us. I want to read the first eight verses of uh, chapter 3. It says, Then Elishim, the high priest, arose with his brothers, the priest, and built the sheep gate. They consecrated it and hung its doors. Now the sons of Hassaniah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. And next to them, Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hakaz, made repairs. And next to him, Meshulam, the son of Bechariah, the son of Meshizabel, made repairs. And Joida, the son of Messiah, and Meshulam, the son of Besadiah, repaired the old gate. These names I'm not pronouncing correctly, so I'm just rolling through here. They laid its beams, hung its doors with its bolts and its bars, and next to him, Hananiah, one of the perfumers, made repairs, and they restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Now, we, I read all of that to say this. You see that there's names here. And Nehemiah recorded each name, uh, whoever wrote the, the book, recorded the names, made it a point here to show who was building what. And, uh, in other words, it wasn't just a team that went out here and they built the whole thing and was through with it and gone. Everybody got involved in rebuilding the wall. And chapter 3 concerns itself with the rebuilding of the walls, but specifically the ten gates that we're going to look at. Now, don't confuse this with New Jerusalem that had 12 gates, totally different. Uh, Jerusalem was a city four square, 1,500 miles in each direction, had four gates, each gate made, made out of uh, each, four gates in each quadrant, which made 12 gates, and each one was made of a solid pearl. And, and that's all over in... Uh, Revelation later on. This is the city of Jerusalem, the old city, and because they had been attacked, the walls were torn down and the gates were burnt. But something stands out well in this chapter, and that's what we want to look at. And uh, each of the gates speak about different experiences in our Christian life that we will come into. It's 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 a progressive. If you want to look at it that way. Now, in fact, I believe it's very progressive. I believe that's why Jesus, over the Beatitudes, when Jesus introduced those, they're progressive also in our walk. We start out at a spot, and we progress along and progress along and progress along. Uh, we're saved at the first, you'll see in these gates. We have salvation, but there's a progression that we go through. And their order and the position that they're in is very specific into our journey as we go along as children of God. So you'll see some things. So get your map out and we'll look at each one and talk about each one and uh, how they relate to us. The first gate that we see up at the top is the sheep gate. And uh, that should be pretty well explainable. It speaks of our very first experience when we come into the Christian life. That's our born again salvation experience. It's realizing that Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now, the reason they called it the Sheep Gate is because this was the gate where the sheep and lambs that were used for sacrifice were brought through. And Jesus was our sacrifice. 
therefore we see a correlation to it in our life. As soon as we realize Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, as soon as we uh, humble ourselves, surrender ourselves, and receive that, then we're born again. We have salvation. So the gate speaks to us not only about that, but of the cross and the sacrifice that was made for our sins. It's the starting point of everything, but you'll notice if you read the entire chapter, when we get through, we come all the way back around to the sheep gate again. We'll go all the way around the wall, we'll wind up back at the sheep gate, and that's because everything starts and ends with Jesus' death on the cross. Our entire life starts with Jesus' death on the cross, and that's where it's going to end. The next gate that we see, just a little bit farther down, is the fish gate. Now, it's called the fish gate because the fishermen of Galilee, that's the gate they would bring their fish into, or bring their catch in to, to be sold in the city. You remember when we was talking about when we first started out in the first chapter, the gates and the walls, the walls was to keep out what didn't belong in. The gates was to allow in what needed to be in. And it symbolized two things. It symbolized the church. It symbolized our individual life. We need our walls strong to keep out the enemy. But our gates here that we come to and we see in our lives is going to let in what needs to be in. And uh, this one, even though it's called Seek Sheep Gate, it speaks of evangelism. Jesus told his disciples, the first thing he told them, he says, I'm going to make you fishers of men. So we see evangelism spoken of right at the beginning. It's a natural progression in our Christian life that after realizing and seeing Jesus has died for our sins, to want to be able to take that message out and share it with somebody else. And uh, that's where we telling somebody else about it. That there's something about that. Uh, the surveys have shown that most Christians in the first two years of their Christian walk, that's when they're going to lead more people to Christ than any other time. After that, we tend to back off. The older we get, the more set we get in the church in our ways, the worse off we get as far as evangelism and witness. You got a zeal, yeah. and you, you're you're so excited. You yeah. want people to have what you've got, yeah. and and really we do. We we plant more seed, and even though we may not see the results of the seed at the moment, years later we may see that same person one to Christ. And, but the seeds we planted had something to do with it. Uh, we don't get better with age. The older we get, the less we'll share. And I hope that's not true in our church, but that's, that's the general trend. The next gate that we come to is called the old gate. And that's not for you and I. Uh, this was the old gate, and it speaks to us of the old ways of truth. A young Christian having experienced this sheep gate that we just talked about here, then the fish gate soon sees the need for experiencing the old gate. And what that basically means is this, learning the old ways of truth that never change. Jeremiah 6.16 states this. He says, Thus says the Lord, Stand by the ways and see and ask for the ancient paths. Where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, there's a whole lot of scripture that uh, says that same thing in a different way. Matthew 6, 6.33, one of them that Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, says basically the same thing. There's something that we need to seek first, and then everything else falls in line. It's when we fail to seek this first, then we have trouble with the strife and of, of all the rest falling in line where it's supposed to be. But it, he said, uh, Jeremiah said, and you will find rest for your souls. So there's a truth there that, that we need, and, and that's called the old gate, that's the old truth, that's another progression of our line. 
uh, after we go through our phase of, of evangelism, we're going to come to a point in our life where we're going to slack off and we're going to look back and get ourselves settled down into the old truth, the truth that never changes, the truth of God's Word, and we'll begin to push on into another phase of our life. The next gate that we see is the valley gate, and you probably immediately jump and get you a picture of what that means. Uh, and you'll also notice that there's a long distance between the old gate and the valley gate. It's a long way. That means from the old gate to the valley gate, we're putting in a lot of truth. We're getting the foundation very strong, and there's a reason for that. Because when we get down here to the valley gate, we're going to need it. For the new Christian, <clears throat> it's kind of, it's not just written anywhere in the Word, but God allows us to go along in a honeymoon period. You may have witnessed that in your early life. That's the reason that when we're first born again, we have we're such an enthusiasm and zeal. We want to lead people to Christ. But it, it's a honeymoon stage. And eventually the honeymoon runs out. Uh, Jesus' disciples had three years, three and a half years of it, and the honeymoon was over, and guess what? Now, they had a wonderful experience at Pentecost, but then they went out and had to do something with it. When Jesus went by the fig tree, and this is something that we really need to know, when Jesus cursed that fig tree, he did, did it for this reason. It's because it had every appearance of something that should have fruit on it, but it didn't. And it speaks to our life because there's, there's a time period that God gives us that we should be producing fruit. And then there comes a time He's wanting to see some fruit. Now, He doesn't curse us and we die. But there's a valley gate that we go through. And uh, it's just a period where He teaches you and His presence is very strong in your life in His honeymoon stage. But then we come to this valley gate and sooner or later, we're all going to get there. It speaks to us about humbling and trials, problems, valley experiences used by the Lord for our personal growth. They're never easy. Uh, we, we, they, I mean, they wrote songs about the mountaintop experience in the valleys, and the valley is always the place where we go through our trials and our tribulations and our problems. But we need to remember something. We came through the old gate to get truth to go through this valley gate experience. In the natural, nothing grows on the mountaintops, but it all grows in the valley. And the trials and tribulations and all that that we go through and the problems we go through is growing experiences. That's where we're going to get the biggest part of our growth is in these valley experiences. And so it's the same in the spiritual as, as it is in the natural. But it's nice because it always produces fruit in the end. Now we travel from there and we go down to, from the valley gate, the dun gate. You might notice that there's still quite a distance from the valley gate to the dun gate. Now the dun gate, or refuse gate, again, it's quite a distance down, indicating that unfortunately that valley experience is probably going to last a while. But the result of the experience is clear in this dun gate. This is the gate that they take all the refuse out of the city, take it down to the uh, Hinnom Valley, and that's where they burn it. That was their garbage dump. It speaks about that in, in uh, Scripture quite a bit. <clears throat> and this is what happens in our life. Valley experiences are going to cause us to get rid of some rubbish. You know, we talked about that last week in the second chapter, getting rid of the rubble and the rubbish so that we can build a wall on a strong foundation. And that's what this valley experience is all about. When we get down here to the Dung Gate, this is where uh, the rubbish has to go. That's where we're refined by fire. That's where it, it actually, all of our experience comes forth and begins to produce fruit. And whenever we clear away the rubbish in our life, which is never easy, but the benefits can be seen in the next gate that we're going to, we won't see them so much in the dumb gate, but we'll see them in the next gate. You'll also notice that at this point in our life at the dumb gate, we take a short 90 degree turn in that wall. 
No, you don't go backwards. There's nothing to go back to. You're always going forward on this gate, on this wall. Our, our life progression is we, we don't ever go backwards. We're going forward all the time. We may not think we are going forward, but we're always moving. You can't go backwards. It's gone. All that past is past. You can't go back and refine it, make it any better, do anything about it. It's gone. And when we come up to this point in our life, we make a 90 degree turn because now we're going up. It's going to be up from then on. Uh, the fountain gate is next. The fountain gate gives us a picture of this. It's located uh, extremely close to the dumb gate, all right. But after a valley experience where the rubbish is cleared out and true faith comes forth, now we need this fountain gate experience. That's where it begins to flow, and it doesn't take long for it to do it. It speaks to us of the living waters of the Holy Spirit that cleanses our lives and empowers us for our Christian life. I guess you could probably call this a, a baptism of the Holy Spirit experience. It's the Spirit and the Word has, does, and always will agree. They'll never go against each other. The next gate is really not that far away. It's called the water gate. This is, has nothing to do with Nixon, by the way. Uh, but it does have a picture of the Word of God in our life. Ephesians 5.26 says this, Having washed her by the water of the Word. Now, it's no coincidence that this one happens to be located pretty close to the fountain gate because they go so close together. You're going to spend, obviously, if distance has anything to do with it, then you're going to have a pretty good experience here in the Holy Spirit before you enter the Watergate part of it. And the Holy Spirit is the one that takes the Word of God and makes it alive to us. This is not salvation. No. We're talking about the Holy Spirit taking something and making it alive to us personally. Personally, in, in a way that it will allow cleansing, encouragement, and direction in our life. This is a place that we'll come to in our Christian walk at some point to where it, all the pieces of the puzzle seem to go together. And what we didn't understand before, now we're, we're able to see. It's a progression that we go through. All starts at salvation. We're saved. Listen, if we died before we ever got to the fish gate, we'd go to heaven. That's not the problem. But God allows all this other. There's a progression in our spiritual life that we go through. And this particular gate here, this water gate, it's a place that we arrive at. We've been washed in the water of the Word. When it says the Spirit and Word agree, you've got to have both. If all you do is, is you're saved and sit on the pew, and all you do is just sit there and hear the Word, you become Word-soaked. You can quote it. You got it up here. You can, you've got it memorized, but it's doing you no good at all. Remember when we started in this study, we talked about knowledge. We've got to have knowledge. We've got to have knowledge, all right, but it's the right application of that knowledge. You can have all the knowledge of Scripture that you want, and that's what happens if all you have is the Word. You're going to have a lot of knowledge, but you're not going to have the power and the get-go and motivation that the spirit side is going to give you in order to take that knowledge and rightly apply it. The other comes in another way. We, we've got over here, we've got the group that's they all they've had is the spirit. They've not had the word. They come into a charismatic movement where uh, it was a great experience and we got flooded with the experience and every time we went to church we just had an experience. Sunday night was a great experience. Was it this Sunday, last Sunday night? Yeah. Yes, last Sunday night was a great experience. There wasn't any word, basically, that went forth other than through song. But we had a wonderful experience of service, and you have to have those. But you have to have both. You have to have a balance of both. You can't live in the experience without some word, and you can't live over here with the word without some experience. You've got to have both, spirit and word agree. And that's where this water gate, that's where we've come to in our walk. 
And the Holy Spirit's the one that makes that personal to us. It's personal because it'll, it'll cleanse us, even though we're already saved. Oh, we've been through all these gates. We've been all the way down through the dung and the fountain gate, but now we get here. There's still, there's cleansing. And what that shows me is all throughout our walk that we're going to walk in this life, there's, all, there's never going to be a moment that we're not going to need a little bit more cleansing and a little bit more cleansing. We'll begin to notice things in our life that need to be cleaned up. The next gate that we come to, in fact, the next three, and you'll see them in rapid succession here, and basically they're kind of prophetic of the end time return of Jesus, but we come to the horse gate. And horse anywhere in the Bible is always a symbol of warfare. And of course, we've been talking uh, in uh, Ephesians chapter 6 about that very thing. That's where we started at, was the warfare. But this speaks to us about uh, the battle that we're going to be experiencing also. Now, in Revelations 19.11, John says this. He said, I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness does he judge and make war. Spiritual warfare, as we see in the study that we're in, is a requirement of every Christian because we're in a battle whether we know it or not. Every day that we get up, we're in a battle. In fact, when you were born again, I heard a speaker the other day on TV say this very thing, but I mean, we should already know it, but when you got saved, whether you went down here or down in the water or wherever you were at, when you come up, you've got a target on your back, and Satan is, is throwing darts at it the whole night. He's looking to bring any Christian down. That's exactly what he wants to do. He wants to destroy your witness. He wants to destroy your family. He wants to destroy your life. He wants you to, to basically disown God. And the more stronger that you get and the more that you say you're not, the more that he's probably going to come against you. But this is just a symbol of warfare. And uh, the last three gates, as I said, are basically prophetic of the end time events, but you'll notice that they're all close together, and so all those events which they symbolize <coughs> prophetically of the end time, but it speaks of the day of the Lord and an end time judgment, and all of that's found in Revelation chapter 6 to 19. I don't know if I put that down on the sheet or not. But then the next gate that we come to is the east gate. And the reason the east gate is prophetic is because uh, that's, that gate is now sealed in Jerusalem. In fact, uh, the Jews had it sealed because nobody will enter that gate. Uh, Jeremiah prophesied that or Ezekiel prophesied that and said the gate that looked toward the east and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate shall be shut, it shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it. For the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. And when Jesus comes back, that's the gate that he'll go through into Jerusalem. So those gates are there. There's still a portion of that old city that's there. The gate's there. The gate is sealed now. But Jesus is the one that prophesied through the prophet Ezekiel over here and said, This gate will be shut and it shall not be opened. No one will enter by it. No one has entered by it since. But when he comes back, that's the gate that, that he will. It looks towards the Mount of Olives, and we know that he'll return to this particular mountain. Uh, Zechariah 14.4 gives another prophecy about it. <coughs> when he says, uh, when he enters, that's the gate that Jesus will enter through. Our Christian life shows us something about this, and the reason that uh, we mention those, even though they're prophetic and towards the end time is because of the hope that we have towards that. Uh, how many of you have noticed on uh, any TV shows, if you watch any TV and you're flicking down through all those 1,000 channels that they got now, uh, the doomsday preppers, and just click on those and, and watch some of that stuff. It's scary. Those people are absolutely, you got two different groups. You got the group over here that says, oh, case of Ross, a rah. They have to let everything go. We'll go out and party, and if it's over, it's over. And then you got the doomsday preppers over here. <coughs> this is kind of an oxymoron to me. Doomsday 
preppers. Who wants to prepare for doomsday? I don't know. I don't understand. I don't quite get that. But then they probably look at it the same way with us. Why would y'all want to be wasting all your time down here listening to somebody preach and teach the Word of God and, you know, for His return? So I don't know. But anyhow, it just uh, it, it's more about how closer we are towards that point. And you know what they're speaking about is the cataclysmic thing that the sun is supposed to burp off something here in 2012 and cause all the power grids to go out and there'll be nothing but chaos. And then uh, one of those commercials, uh, Brother Tim Eggers mentioned to me, he said, did you catch what they said on there? Because it's an advertisement. But they said when it happens that we'd lose gravity on the earth and everybody would float out into space. Well, yeah, he said, you, maybe that's the way we'll go. <laughs> no, we're going in a twinkling of an eye. Some of them might flow out, but carry on. My youngest daughter, Fanny, she was telling me all about that. She's got the Holy Ghost and everything. She said, you, Mom, you better pray. And I said, before that happens, yeah. God is going to come to the rapture with us. Yeah. And I mean, she said, oh, you better be saving all these things up to people. And I said, To a, there's there's a place in our Christian walk, and where do we hit it? Is it a, you know, it's not an age factor. It's not something that you you can pinpoint and say, well, this one will reach it at this particular time. And no, it's just a point that we personally come to in our life. And like I say, we're saved. We're saved up here at the Sheep Gate. So if a person never happens to, I believe everybody will. If, if we don't do nothing but realize it right before. We're out of here in the blink of an eye. I believe that we'll, at some point in our life, we'll all come to a place where things, the pieces of the puzzle, will begin to fall together and we'll begin to see. I remember 30 years ago when we first got started in the church, almost 40 now, but uh, there were things then prophetically that they didn't even understand. And, and one of my biggies was Russia. God coming down to invade Israel and I said well how is that going to take does that, does, that, does that mean the Soviet Union well then later years we saw all that bust up and now the Soviet Union is not the Soviet Union it's Russia is Russia and so there's a lot of things that have come into play uh, the scene is set right now it is set I mean just almost as well as it can be set for all of the things to happen, and I mean instantly. You could wake up one morning and all that can change just that quick. The economy can collapse that quick. Well, 30 years ago, we wouldn't have dreamed of that. We were, we were set and doing well. But now we're not so sure that that couldn't happen overnight. It, it can't. But here's what it talks about in this, this final gate. This is uh, uh, not the final gate here, the gate that we were just in and talking about. Eastgate, uh, this is the place where our hope is at in the return of Jesus. And uh, Brother Hagen had a verse of scripture over in James chapter 4. It talks about the return of Christ. James, the book of James is not all just about the tongue, controlling the tongue. It's, there's, it talks about faith and it talks about the return of Christ. He was inspired and he never, when he spoke, 
he never failed to mention that passage of Scripture so that he left people with the hope that your Savior is going to return. He, he's coming back. He always used that very verse of Scripture. And I was reading a little book that, that he did, which I've had for years, and I really couldn't remember what was in it. That's why I was reading. And he mentioned in there that he did a Wednesday night service, and he realized the service was almost over, and he hadn't mentioned that Scripture, and the Lord brought it to him. In fact, he was closing, the, the closing out, and the Lord brought it to his attention, and he, he mentioned it again. But it's over in uh, James chapter 4 and I believe 16, but it talks about the return of Christ. And it's just, it goes along with what we're talking about here. That should be uppermost in our lives. That's where our hope is at. If we look to the world out here, any at all, there is no hope there. There's no retirement for the young people coming up. There's no, there's not even jobs. I mean, they're talking about now, you know, with the, the college getting their uh, interest rates lowered, well, how's that going to happen if they ain't got a job in the first place? They got, they got to have a job. They got to have something to do. But anyhow, our hope is not in all that. Our hope is in Christ. That's the only hope that we got. And for even the young people coming up, that's the reason we need to make sure that they have instilled in them, this is your hope. This is Christ is the hope. One day, regardless of what we study or how many degrees we got, we're going to be facing Him and we're going to be out of here. The last gate is the, the inspection gate. And guess what that is? That's kind of like the checkout counter in a supermarket. So where you go, this is the inspection gate. Now, we've already passed inspection. We've got a seal upon us, and, and we've made it. But this is talking about the Bema Seat of Christ, where we'll be inspected and rewarded. That's after we go to be, uh, Jesus comes and gets us. There's a seven-year period while this world's going through tribulation that we're going to be out there with that. We're going to be in a beam of judgment. He's going to be handing out rewards. The rewards <coughs> are not for us to run around heaven showing how much we got. Those are the rewards and crowns that the Bible says we'll lay at Jesus' feet. <coughs> and, and it doesn't matter about how many you got. It's just the fact that, hey, if you're there at all, you're in, you're in a good place. Yeah, we made it. But anyhow, that uh, there's another judgment that will take place. Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46 talks about that. That's the rest of the world. That's, that's uh, those that come in later after the tribulation. It's called the white throne judgment, great white throne judgment. And they will be judged for their sins. What they've done good, what they've done bad makes no difference. They'll be judged for that. And they will be the same way, rewarded appropriately for that. Well, what is all this if we just boil it all down together? What does all this mean for us today? I want to share five things with you that it does mean. Because when we started Nehemiah, remember I told you that it applies two ways. It, it applies to me individually. I have to look at these things and put it into my own life. But then it also applies to the church corporally, all together. And so we, we look at it in that way. And it, it's really neat that we've come to this place right now where we're at because we're in a new building, we're, we're growing, you know, and things really take on some meaning to us that we see here. The first thing that we see, and I think that's on your page there, but it's a team effort. It's not just the pastor's job. If the walls and the gates were going to be rebuilt in Nehemiah's time, it meant everybody had to have a part in it. That's why when we read that passage over there at the first and all those names that I couldn't pronounce, and it even mentioned one down there, the perfumer. This, this was a guy that made and sold perfumes. But he didn't mind getting his hands dirty and building the wall also. See what I'm saying? And all these people had different jobs, but they knew the wall had to be built. They knew the gates had to be restored in order for them to have security and protection. And it's the same way in your life. The, the pastor has a job in the five-fold ministry had, are gifted and given to the church for a purpose, but it's for all of us's benefit. 
the pastor's not gifted just for his benefit, so he can run around and you know know all the scripture and, and and do the things that he does. It's for all of us his benefit, and for any one of us, any part that we play in the church, it's for our personal benefit, but it's also for the church's benefit. And that's why we have to, it's a team effort. <coughs> The pastor's not just a one-man band. He plays pretty good. There's a lot of other members of the band out there. And there's a lot of members of the band out here that we all work together. It's for the edification of all. Uh, Ephesians, and I want to read this, and it should be on your sheet, but Ephesians 4, 11, and 13. And you've heard this many, many times. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith. That's the purpose that we see ourselves coming to. There's no greater success than you can have in a, a, a minister's work, a, a church, than unity. If the church is in unity, it's a successful church. A successful church is not built on numbers. That's not what it's about. It's the love and unity that that church has together because that's where people are going to grow and reach out and bring others in, is in a church that's in unity and has that love. <clears throat> and it says, of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And that's what we're each seeking for. That's what uh, God is the workman inside of us. But that's what he's bringing us to so that we will come in to be this image of Christ himself. So that we'll, we'll be the same as what or have the fullness that he had. Now you'll notice that the giftings that people have are for the equipping of the saints in their work of service. And this is what we learned from Nehemiah and what he showed us here in this, in this book and in these chapters. Some are gifted in particular areas, but they worked in other areas. A perfumer, but he's out here building the wall because he knew it had to be done. It was for the betterment of all of them. They all helped in whatever way they could. In fact, even that was what they could do, they all jumped in and became a part of it. Everybody had something to offer. <clears throat> That's the second point. And you might be unsure of your gifting or what God's called you to do with your life. And maybe you don't have anything that you think you don't have anything to offer. But every one of us. Sometimes just a person, I remember a church that we went to in our early years. It was a Baptist church. And there was four ladies that always sat on about the second row in the front on this side of the church. And they were all those, uh, I call them cotton heads, because they're all just white, I mean, look like cotton balls on top of their head. And all four of them, I don't think one of them was under 80. They were all in their 80s or above. But there was four of them. Every Sunday you saw those. That, in fact, they were the first ones in the church. When you come, I don't care how early you got there, they'd be sitting up there on that second row. Well, now you might say they didn't have a whole lot to contribute. They, they, were, they couldn't sing anymore. They didn't do a whole lot, but they were there. They were like a fixture in the church, and you expected them to be there. And uh, it was just, you know, that was their part, was just being there. It, it just, it enlightened everybody else just to know that they, when they come in the door, they were going to see those ladies. And I'm sure because I know that when I pastored the church that I pastored, there was a lady there, that, and she was in her 80s when we came there, and she had been praying for the last four years for a pastor. God had sent a pastor to that church. And when they finally called us as we came, the first thing she said to me, she said, I am so glad you're here. She said, now I can go on. And she was ready to go. She said, I'm so glad you got here because <laughs> now I can go on. We, had, we started a prayer service on Tuesday nights. She drove 14 miles by herself to that prayer meeting. You could always count her on being right over on the front row. She'd be over there in prayer. And I know she prayed for me at other times. 
but she did. She passed away. We'd been there three or four months. I don't remember. Might have been a little longer. <clears throat> she passed away and died three times. Her husband kept uh, praying for her to come back. She, God brought her back. And the, the third time when she came back to, she said, don't pray for me no more. She says, I'm going to be with Jesus. And he told her, okay. And she went on. But uh, a wonderful woman. What part did she play in that church? i tell you one part that she played in God's ministry. Every month, she sent out over 300 cards to missionaries. Just with a little, it all in her hand. She paid for the stamps and the cards. It was just something that she did. But she wrote over 300 cards to missionaries just encouraging them and letting them know she was praying for them. The woman had a terrific ministry. <coughs> But everybody's got something to offer. doesn't make any difference what that you do. <clears throat> Another thing uh, that we see there is the rebuilding often began at home. I want to read you a few more verses, verses 10, 23, and 30. I'm just going to hop around because, again, it's just names, but I want you to see this. It says, next to them, Jedediah, the son of Haramoth, made repairs opposite his house. After them, Benjamin and Hashem carried out repairs in front of their house. It would be kind of like us saying, let's say they were rebuilding here, and I say, well, there's Caroline and Kenny. They, they built the section wall over by their house. And then Brother Gary and Melissa, they built the section next to their house. And then Judy built the section over next to her house. And then uh, uh, Bobby and Raymond, they built the section next to their house. You see what I'm saying? And that's what he's saying here. This, this is the thing about it. They didn't go out. They, re, they took the task right where they were, rebuilding right where they were at. And what that drives home to us is this. I believe there's too many people in the church world. I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking about in the church world. And I've seen this over our 38, almost 40 years of being in different churches that too many times people are out trying to do a work in a church somewhere and lose their own family. You see what I'm saying? How many of you ever watched the movie Fireproof? Uh, it's a good movie. What that movie is basically saying is this. you got to take care of the home front first. That's, that's my interpretation of what the whole movie says. Take care of the house first. I'll never forget one time it was at an Easter uh, service. Uh, and We'd had an Easter egg hunt and all. And here come our little <coughs> five-year-old at the time, Angie. And uh, she had a great big sack full of candy and eggs and stuff that she'd got. And there was another little kid that was there that didn't get anything. And he was just a ball. So I took some of Angie's to give him. And then she started crying. And I'm trying to explain to her, you know, this is part of being a Christian is sharing what you got. Well, she's a five-year-old. She don't understand that. She said. But here's the thing about it. Is it right to take from those that have to give those that have not? I understand the little kid. What we should have done was went and got him some somewhere. We had to go to the store and buy it ourselves. You see what I'm saying? And here's what happens in the home. The church, that's probably the biggest, greatest, largest hindrance to the church today is trying to build somebody else's wall while my own wall is crumbling. You see what I'm saying there? And if we're not careful, and the church as a whole, I'm talking about, can do the same thing. The church can't get involved in more things than what it can function and take care of. It can't support 40 missionaries out there when it can't pay its own bills. That'd be ridiculous. God doesn't want us to do that. And also in our personal life, I don't care how much the need is for this one over here. My, my conclusion is this. This is what I came to grips with a long time ago. If I can't fix it, it's not my problem. 
It's God's. And let Him go. Now, if God tells me to go do that, then, then that becomes my problem, and He'll supply all the need to take care of it. But if I can't fix it, it's not my problem, and I, I just leave it alone. All right, the principle for us is to make sure we've taken care of our lives at home first before we're used to help others. We have to make sure we're not different people in and outside of the church, that we're the same both ways. And I know that I went through that problem in, in our life, and I was a deacon in the Baptist church. I taught Sunday school. I was the pastor's own personal uh, assistant to his a special class that he started for new converts. Actually, people didn't even belong to the church yet, but they had great tithing potential, so they made a special class for them. But uh, I don't agree with all that. I'm just saying that's what, what really happened. But anyhow, in all those things, my own family life was crumbling as a result of it. And I had to go through a, a spell in the hospital in order to get myself straightened out and get, actually for God to get me to a place where I was quiet and could listen to where he could actually talk to me. And when I learned that, from then on, I learned how to listen to him first instead of taking off in my own direction. The next thing that we want to see is the works voluntary. There's a lot of people today that's not going to do anything unless you show them what's in it for them. It's a voluntary work. Uh, I, I've had a, a lady come into our church that we pastored in Ohio one time, offered us a pretty large sum of money, but she wanted to use it for a flagpole <laughs> out in front of the church, which was about the dumbest thing I ever seen in my life. We didn't have it 20 feet from the church to the street. And she wanted a flagpole put out there. That's, now she's going to donate the money. Right? No problem there. But she wanted to specify what the money would be spent on. And I said, I'm sorry, but we don't do that. She, she said, you mean that you won't accept my money? I said, not for something that you won't done. I said, it all goes into the pot, and what God tells us to do with it, then that's what we'll do. But I said, we don't specify anything. As Baptists, Baptists do that. We, I, I've been in churches where they had a string of money they had to account for every month because somebody had given $10 for new carpet 20 years ago and nobody else had ever given any more. They couldn't buy a carpet for 10 bucks, but they couldn't use the money for anything else because it was specified. So there it was tied up and they had to keep track of it all those years. So I said, no, we don't do that. If you want to give your money, fine. And I said, if it, if it falls in and we can afford a flagpole and feel like we need one, we'll put one up. <laughs> but we're not going to specify it for no flagpole. So the work's volunteer. And uh, Chuck Swindoll, if you ever heard of him, he said this, one of the biggest areas of discouragement comes when Christians think that they get their rewards in this life. You know. All that you give, you may never see nothing out of it in this life. Our reward comes later on when we get on the other side. God will bless us here. Don't misunderstand it. Every one of us, I'll guarantee you, can, can stand up and testify. God has blessed us and blessed us mightily. We're blessed just because we can be here this morning without having to go through a, a squad out here, you know, with guns, letting us check in our IDs or something. We're just blessed. We can come in and have a service when we get good and ready. The next point, and it's probably the most important that I want you to see, is that God is a recorder of names. All these scriptures that we read, you notice it was all names. God was very specific in having every one of them recorded. You and I can go back in history and trace those names and find out that those were actual people that in that day and time, even though it was 534 B.C., if you could find the records and trace them back, and the Jews' records do go back, but those people are there. They were there. They was an actual person. But God carefully had that recorded for a reason. He's, he, God is so uh, detailed and minute that he records a person's name and helped build crumbling walls. And he's got your name written. 
fact, the scripture tells us. Our names were recorded in it, in that book. He knew us before the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians, what Paul wrote in Ephesians. Here's a verse in Malachi that I want to read to you that you may not have ever even heard before, and if you read it, it may not have meant a whole lot to you at the time. It's certainly not one we hear every day, but it's in Malachi 3, 16 and 17, and I made sure that was written on your list. But it says this, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. Now, that would be the same as saying that you and I come in here, we fear the Lord. That doesn't mean that we're scared of Him. It means we, we have a fear and an awe of God. We love Him. And we speak to one another concerning that. It gets God's attention. So what it means is, is that when we come together, whether it's to teach, preach, worship, pray, whatever it is, we get God's attention. He knows exactly who's there. And He knows exactly what we're talking about. And it gets his attention, and he heard it, and then it says, And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. And then he says this, And they will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession. And I'll spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. That's where our hope is at. It's in him. Our lives and actions are recorded by the Lord for our rewards in the life to come. It's not done for anything on this earth, although there's nothing wrong with having things on this earth. I, I believe fully that God really wants His people to prosper and do very well in all areas of their life. But listen, what we do and what we do for Him is not something that we go around expecting rewards for because we'll get rewards on the other side. In fact, Jesus said, if you, even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, He says, I've got a record of it, and I know. If nothing goes unnoticed by the Lord, do you think maybe we should be a little bit more careful about what we do? Hebrews 6.10 is the last verse I'm going to read, and it says this, God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you've shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. Everything we do for one another, <clears throat> the saint of God, everything, God takes notice of. Every little detail. I don't care if you just go up and see somebody that looks sad and pat them on the back and tell them how much you love them and appreciate them. You know, find something good to say about them. Gee, you dress well. Nothing else. <laughs> Your hair looks good. Something. Find something good to say. God said he takes notice of all that. He records it. Well, that's chapter 3, and guess what? <clears throat> chapter 4 is a lengthy one, and we probably won't do it all in one lesson. Uh, but then we'll skip all the way after we get through with chapter 4. We'll go to chapter 6 and chapter 13. We're not going to hit every book or every chapter from here on out. We did do the first three. We'll do chapter 4. We'll skip to chapter 6. And then uh, 13 is where we'll wrap it up. And uh, praise God, I hope you got something out of that. Anybody got a comment or a question? I'll be glad to help you out best I can. Otherwise, be blessed.